Okay, so um, we have a bit of a tiny mini keynote uh, talk right now, a pep talk um, by Tom Garza, who is an associate professor in the Department of Slavic Languages. He teaches Russian. I wish all our Kazakh friends were here. They're not here yet, but maybe when they come in, the delegation from Kazakhstan comes in, he can give them a shout out. Um, yes, and he's also um, the director of the Texas Language Center. And uh, let's see, what else do I want to say? Um, he teaches Russian language and literature at all levels, foreign language pedagogy. He's just started a new, uh, with a team of people, started a new graduate uh, portfolio in foreign language um, education, language teaching, and program coordination at UT. Um, he's been here for 28 years and has won all kinds of teaching awards. I won't go into the long, long list, but um, he's really run a very successful program, successful study abroad program, and he's going to talk today about that all-important topic, how do we grow our programs, how do we make it successful, how do we get more students to take Turkish, Kazakh, Uzbek, or whatever. Okay, so uh, please uh, give him a warm welcome. I'm going to try to do this without the mic simply because I teach a 300 person course on vampires, and my microphone never works in that room, and somehow I've gotten now a voice that my wife says is just annoying. <laughs> uh, it's a little probably more than you need, but if, if you have any trouble hearing me, let me know. Let me get to just, I have a few slides I'm going to use just to just kind of set us up, but I really want to leave. I'm, I'm, I'm actually going right after this to teach in my, I'm teaching fourth year Russian right now. So these are my really advanced students, so I, I would love to be able to make a few remarks and then get any questions from you that you might have to start us off. Um, first, let me start by adding my voice of welcome to those that you've already heard. This is, uh, I have to admit, when I uh, was first invited by Jeanette to come and, and uh, address you, I was excited. Say, I've never met with a group. So you, I've met with a lot of the AATs, Spanish and Portuguese, and French, Russian, obviously. So, so Turkish, how, is that a... You know, I thought about there to be three or four. How many teachers of Turkish in America and the world can there be other than in Turkey? And then suddenly I saw that list of name tags, and wow, I'm impressed. And look at you all here. You came during, as not only our only freeze we'll probably have in 2018, but actually today it's going to get up to the 60s, and by tomorrow it's going to be stellar. You're going to so <laughs> welcome, welcome to Austin, and we're keeping you indoors instead of being outside to enjoy the weather. Uh, I have been now directing the Texas Language Center. We'll, this will be our 10th year next year. that We begin our 10th year in the Texas Language Center. I've been at UT for nearly 30, um, working in that time trying to address questions that not are, are just language pedagogy general, but especially about what you, you probably heard this term too much relating our languages, including mine, Russian and Turkish, the Liptals, the less commonly taught languages which always to me is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's great news because Lyptals tend to get more funding. The government likes to put money into strategic languages. So that's the good side, is we tend to get a little bit of extra money put on us as less commonly taught. But on the other side, we always have that L, less. You know, right? I mean, you're less common, you're less taught, you're less, I don't like that. I'd like to be called something like, the more rare languages, <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> but given that we're Lictals, given that we are, in a sense, in the minority, we need to make sure, as always, in this shrinking budget world, in this world where we have fewer students who are focusing on humanistic endeavors, to make sure our courses stick, that they work. And so I really enjoy courses that matter, that our language courses need to be directed not just to each other as Oh, I've designed a new course in, and pick your favorite way of twisting it, right, of turning it, <laughs> Turkish language through literature, Turkish language through culture, Tur however you want to do it, that it makes us feel good about what we're doing, but does it make the students feel good? Are we getting students to take our courses, or are we just talking to each other? So today, just in a few minutes, is to give you a couple of remarks about what some, literally four things that I think we can do in designing our courses and delivering our product, if you will, that make these courses matter to our students who are taking them. The first one I want to talk about is was innovated here at UT. 
Uh, I was very pleased to be involved fairly early on. We had a wonderful director of our Arabic program here who's now in Beirut, in fact, directing the Arabic program at American University Beirut, um, Mohamed al Batl, who d innovated an Arabic, a way of delivering Arabic so that our students could actually reach in a four year university program advanced plus to superior. I'm speaking in actful terms now, so you know that cone of proficiency all the way at the top, superior level proficiency in four years. Unprecedented that a language as difficult for Americans to learn as Arabic could be taught in this particular way. So good was this method, he was awarded in 2008 an Arabic flagship. We've had it here at the University of Texas now for more than 10 years, 2007, I correct there, since we've been, now had it for 12 years here at UT. Um, uh, the, and this flagship model, as we call it, has become a greater national model, not just for flagship <coughs> programs, but for what we call now intensive programs, where we give the students an incredibly intense introduction to the language with a six, six, six hours a week model that means six hours in class of face-to-face -face instruction and then a whole slew of work outside of class that's meant to be the classic flipped classroom, right, to give them grammar instruction, lexical instruction. What does it mean? Is it for students, I'm going back to that same question, how do we make it a course that matters for students? One is that at UT Austin we still have a two-year language requirement for, for our students in liberal arts. So they can fulfill that requirement in one year. So already we say, okay, that's great for the students. What does it mean about us for language content? Is it, are we cheating us now? Truth be told, we actually are able in this model to cover not just the content we need, but actually to hit proficiency benchmarks that make the students happy and us happy as well. So in one year, we fulfill a two-year language requirement. We can attain, and here's the cool part, intermediate, mid to high proficiency, depending on the student's ability, in, in, in not even one calendar year, in 30 weeks, right? This is actually an academic year, nine months, that we're able to do what we have traditionally, even in our more difficult languages, less commonly taught languages, in two semesters. So again, this looks great for the students, it's great for us. Now, the part that to me really is good for us, but the students, we don't tell them it's good for them too, is that what we've done in doing the one year Intensive immersion is get them ready to take advanced level courses as early as their sophomore year. Can you imagine going into third year Turkish in year two of your college career if you started with zero? That's pretty impressive. And we flagship programs nationally. Everyone know what the flagship is? The national I've seen most of the right? So these big government funds, a lot of money put into them. Their whole goal is to get students in critical languages to these very, very high levels of proficiency in four years. So we get students ready for, for uh, advanced level courses, and of course, even after one year, we can talk about getting them to, to a really meaningful study abroad experience. Whether it's a capstone experience, something at a very high level for a long period of time, or even one summer of study, but getting them abroad. I'm going to return to that in just a second. So intensive courses make them make the courses, as it were, worth their time. Then make our courses part of being a destination. Millennials, a lot's been said about the millennial generation now, and now Generation Z. Have any of you, got, have you met Generation Z? Another interesting group. Millennials tricked us. When we first met them a couple of years ago, these were students who on the surface appeared not to be interested in academic matters all that much. Actually, they didn't appear to be interested in much, except their cell phones and social networks and getting more friends on Instagram, more likes on their posts. And that turned out to be, thanks to the, at least some empirical data from the 2016 election here, not the case. Millennials are extremely interested in, in their words, not mine, in making a difference. They're very interested in doing something relevant. They want, to, they want to kind of shake things up. There's actually more of a connection for my generation, in fact, the generation who grew up in the 60s and the millennials than I ever wanted to believe was possible. But our generation said, we're going to change this whole Vietnam War thing. We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to change the world so that by the year 2000, it's going to be wonderful, beautiful. We're all going to love each other. We, we didn't do so great, but let's hope the millennials do better. The destination part of what we do could not be more critical right now. We've always talked for generations practically about we study languages so that we can read the great literature, and of course we can visit the, the, 
beautiful countries that, that our languages are spoken in, but really make it a destination, not simply a visit that's got beautiful sites, that's kind of a sine qua non, but actually have a, an incorporated study abroad program. Make your study abroad partner, whether it's in Turkey proper or another institution abroad, make it so that their curriculum and yours really are integrated, so it's part of the curriculum the students are doing. Ideally, find an institution that's willing also to give your students who are there externship experience. This is something we stole, borrowed permanently, from the flagship program as well, was that we found that students who in country weren't just studying Turkish, but were actually working in, say, very simply could be working, we've had students in, in Arabic-speaking countries, for example, working with an Arabic newspaper, working in an Arabic orphanage, working in schools, working in uh, hospitals, really as externs. They're not learning a job per se, but they're learning the language of that job relatively well. And those, the combination of being in country, studying the language, and actually having an externship makes a huge difference in the students wanting to continue the language to the highest possible level. My favorite point, if you remember nothing else, if you remember, mem be memorable. I'm going to try to be memorable on this one point. Make your class something that they really, really do remember. That it's not, oh yeah, I took four courses last semester. One of them was Turkish. Let's see. My instructor was... Let's see, it started with an O, it had, how many, uh, O, Grady, no, that was my Irish lit class, <laughs> Okur, Okur, that's it, yes, I, right, no, we want us to be, we want to be the focus of our classes, be an egotist, briefly. This is where I say it's not embarrassing to show off that you're really good at what you do. And not only are you good as teachers, your courses are great. And Turkish is the best thing you've ever seen, heard, delivered. So what does that mean? What does it take to make a language not something we simply say? Open your book to page 45. We're starting with exercise three. Right? Class time should be face time. Things that students can do on their own without us, they should do on their own without us. Grammar, we shouldn't be in the class to do what a textbook or an online presentation does at least as well as we do. In some ways better because students can repeat it as often as they want. The time we spend with our students in class should be face time. Face to face with them, face to face, small groups, large groups, whole group, but it should all be in communication, in active communication. Culture's everything from day one. Language and culture, culture should not be considered a fifth skill. We've moved away mercifully, finally, from saying teaching, reading, writing, listening for individual skills. We teach today, Monday's listening day, we're going to listen to a text, we'll talk. Everything's integrated, we've gotten away from that, we now know everything's integrated. We listen so that we can respond, we read something so we can write about it or say something about it. Everything's integrated and culture is integrated into everything from day one. Do not be afraid. Our students now, again, this is great for this new generation, the uh, millennials and Gen Z are super, super interested in who am I over there, right? It's not about their ego, by the way, at least this is my <coughs> modest observation. This is about Gen Z and, and the millennials actually wanting to understand the larger globe that they see on their cell phones. They can get on a Turkish website with no problem. But who are these people writing these posts? Who are they actually? So culture is everything. Don't be afraid to introduce culture from day one, from the very beginning, and just rotate all through. Remember our learners are individuals. This sounds like something that came out of the 1980s because it did, right? Individualized instruction, that doesn't mean one-on-one. -on -one. What it means is that we have to remember that as I'm looking at you and I see a group of 20-ish individual teachers, I can't make a generalization about you at all, except that you all are interested in teaching Turkish. Other than that, I would be a fool to stand up here and assume you've all traveled extensively, you all have had a, you all have PhDs. You all are, um, uh, you all come from rich families. 
I can't make assumptions about your class, about your social background, about your, your education. I can't do that. And we can't do that with our students. They're not, they're not a mass of University of Texas students learning Turkish or Russian or Arabic, but rather they're in e each case an individual learning for a different reason. Quick antidote on this. My generation actually, to some extent, was much easier. We did come into language classrooms, especially if it was a language that was hard, Arabic, Turkish, Persian, Russian, because we wanted to read the great works. I took Russian in 1976, knowing nothing about Russian, except that I wanted to read Tolstoyevsky, right? Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and everything in between. <coughs> So it was much easier back in the day when we said, you're learning French because you want to be able to read Proust. Right? You're learning X because you're going to read the great literature. We simply don't have that in our classes anymore. There may still be a few students who do. That's why they wanted to take it, because they want to read the big works. But most of our students are taking it for what? I want to work with Médecins Sans Frontières in, in Turkey. I want to work with AIDS research in a hospital. I want to work with orphan relief. They want to do what they want to do with the language. So we, can't, we cannot put it upon ourselves. By the way, I'm going to free you of a, bit, of a bit of guilt here. We will never create the perfect set of teaching materials that's going to cover all of our students, ever. But if we do consider each learner as an individual, what we can do in our classroom is try to accommodate all the different things they want. I go back to the original slide about the flipped classroom. When we take out of our presentation in class grammar, lexicon, uh, 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 some of the cultural information, all of these things, and put them off at home, let the students work on those on their own, classroom time can be spent much more getting to know what are your individual needs and therefore letting the student then go home and do that work on their own. That becomes part of a larger portfolio that the students can do as part of your classroom. You talk, do it, happy to at any point, by the way, I'll give you the last slide has my email. If you want to talk more about portfolios, we can have a long Skype call about that, I promise. But think about this, and this is going to lead to my last slide. Think about what, who's in our classrooms as a separate point of what we're teaching. And I've added this. I used to only have three slides here because three is the magic number, but I've added a fourth one because more and more, especially if you are teaching in a school in the States, and even if you're, no long, if you're teaching globally, we can't, again, think of our student population as monolithic. We really here at UT, I've noticed in the last years, we are not, I don't want to say we're failing, but we are not yet succeeding at being fully inclusive in our language class, in any of our classes, but especially language. Why do I sp specifically point out language classrooms? If you haven't gotten the point of your own student's fear in the classroom, why is it that they won't utter that sound, that word? Right? If you, I still remember early French classes where, and it was very gendered, the men in the class simply would not say the sound e, because they said, as I asked my colleague who would not say e, why won't you do that? Because it makes my mouth look funny. Right? Who will not make certain sounds, who will not do certain things in the classroom, is because language performance is one of the most personal things we do. It's very much about who we are. Making a mistake in a language about how we speak can be really uh, uh, painful to each individual student. And so when we're not taking into account who all these students are. And by that, you can see from the kind of mosaic here, what needs, what special needs do they have? What are their, do, do you, for example, as we did in Russian, only accommodate very normative relationships in our textbooks? Did our textbook only say he <coughs> married to her? When indeed in my class, I had students who were not going to ever be married to a her or to a, a he. They were being married to another he or another she. Mm -hmm. And for them, being able to go through that dialogue of, in Russian, so imagine this in your, in your own mind in Turkish, practicing future tense, right? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Will you be married? Who will you marry? 
And do we accommodate the fact that what happens when a student doesn't fit into the normative, normative paradigm that our textbooks have? What happens when, as I just observed this watching uh, classes at the University of Kansas just last week, when I address a student and say, tell me about get past tense, what did you do yesterday? And she, seemingly, as I look at her, replies to me using a masculine ending. I did my homework, I went to the movies, and I had a dinner with my friends, all using masculine endings. And I, as an instructor, do what? I correct by repeating it using masculine. She says it back to me using masculine. What do I do? The student Is the student making a grammatical mistake? Not if she doesn't identify as a woman. But as instructors, do we even consider these questions? Now, why do I bring this up? It seems like a small point about making, you know, keep, keep retention and all, and yet, I started off the whole little presentation here with this idea that we're trying to make our classes the ones that our students remember. And to the extent that our Turkish classes are not usually 40 students, 50 students taking Turkish with us, or Russian, or Arabic, or Persian, is to try to say, in this particular class, I was so impressed because my instructor actually cared about who I was. And because what we're doing, guys, is so incredibly personal, language and culture instruction, think about it, right? I mean, who's the only other, how else had we gotten our first languages? From a parent, from parents, from those around us. It's a very familial uh, relationship that got us our first language, we're now playing in a way that role of trying to be, in a way, a nurturer who's getting the student into learning a second or third or fourth language, right? And so to keep that feeling of, I do remember my Turkish class, because that's the one class where my professor actually asked me how I would, what pronoun do I use? Do I want to be he, she, or they? Yeah? So in that vein, if you think about this, go, starting with the first slide, keep our classes as intense as possible, which already is predicating it that you know your students. Make it a memorable experience for them. Think about the students individually. Be, in, be inclusive in them. And I assure you, I assure you, given the experience we've seen in our flagship program, that those would, will indeed keep our students coming to your Turkish classes. So that's, those are the I said four points I wanted to make, and I've left a few minutes here, about eight, nine, ten minutes. We could, any questions, disagreements, you can say you're an idiot, what a jerk, you're stupid, how could you say that? I don't believe you. I'm happy to hear it. <laughs> questions, comments, discussion, anything, anything at all. <coughs> yes, ma'am. No. I, I can find a question. Just... Uh, comments, even, even more so. Especially on inclusivity. Yes. So I put in my syllabus that students you know, I want to be Please let me know if you if you let me know. And I will happy to know your pronouns. Yes. And also in every assignment I or quiz or whatever. So I put their preferred names so they might also not apply to you know, their first name. Whatever That's official right. name. That's know? right. So they can prefer other pronouns and all. So putting it even in the syllabus. It makes it, it, it formalizes yes, it, right? Formalizes. It formalizes it. It also means every, it, it's, it's routine. This is what we're going to do. I'm not making a special case. I'm not, this is simply yes. how I want to do the class, yes. right? I, that's absolutely and on the one mark. one more thing I do in the first class. Please. I, I hand out the background check. Mm -hmm. um, I also adapted this from um, Cassandra Gillian's yes. Social Justice book. Yes. So, um, you know, there are questions. Sure. Very simple question, like, uh, what would you prefer, I mean, would you prefer living without a phone or would you prefer living without a leg, for example? Right. Something like right. that, you know, wow. that, and it will, yeah. it will bring up, you know, their perspectives about life. Precisely. And again, what you're doing with that and what Gilan has done is trying to get at the yeah. individual sitting in yes. your class. Yes, yes. And I look at them and, oh, okay. So, for example, daily activities, right? Right. Or, or free time activities. Right. Or they, or they like to use, okay, then I should, you know, revise my past year activity and vocabulary list, you know, 
So, and why would someone, for example, a what? student who doesn't they like don't. doing a, a hobby, why would, would you do this, right? Would speak about, oh, I like Precisely. doing that. Yeah. Precisely. So again, and re and this this idea, very much an important one here, make your class memorable means right. the class you taught last year, or even the class if you're doing two sections of first year Turkish, the class you have at nine o'clock and the class you have at eleven o'clock, are also different classes. They're as individual as the students in them. So you need to do this. You're quite right. You need to do this for every class. It doesn't it's a lot of work, of course. You know, always, changing always everything, not only the vocabulary, but the actual assignments, all everything. the assignments. So, I mean, yeah. of course, it's a lot of work, but then it also, you know, keeps students engaged, and then yes. you know, they they feel valued. Actually. So I might add. So if you if you are feeling, because you're right, it, it sometimes will overwhelm us how much work right, it seems yeah. to make. This is where I also think you can, at some point reach the, I've made my accommodations, mm -hmm. now your accommodation, students, is to do activities, you create activities for your interests, and that's the portfolio. Mm -hmm. So if you include a portfolio as part of your instruction, which means students may do, say, I'm just coming up with these numbers, let's say a portfolio has to have 20 mm -hmm. activities, 10 of the activities will be assignments you give them. Right. Yeah. The other 10 they will come up with, based on their interests. So I've had students in first year roughly interested in everything. I'm not. I'm not joking. From okay, uh, competitive sailing. I know. I know nothing about competitive sailing, but this student really wanted to develop her vocabulary on that. Another student interested in breeding horses. Again, I'm not a big specialist in horse breeding. I learned a lot that semester about sailing and horse breeding. But the students worked on those <coughs> topics on their own as part of a portfolio, and that's cool. Again, that's including them, that's keeping them interested in our assignment. As you said, right, back in my day, everyone read the same text. Right, yeah. We have the same text for everybody. And maybe it did interest all of you, but it didn't interest you. <coughs> this way, we try as much as we can. I, we're never going to please everybody 100%, but we're going to at least try that sense of feeling, giving the class a sensation of trying to include everybody. Thank you. That was terrific. That's terrific. Anyone else? Uh, and welcome to the new ones, the newcomers who came in for joining us. Here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Welcome to Austin University of Texas. Any other comments, questions? You guys are so cooperative. Okay, does this mean you disagreed with everything or you agreed with everything? Either way, this is not a good idea. <laughs> yes, please. This is the part of Turkish culture, I guess. We are using silence. <laughs> So, so see, that's something I would need on your card <laughs> to yeah. say, don't expect me to be very, very uh, opinionated <laughs> we, because otherwise I'll assume you just hate me. And I <laughs> well, I yes, please, go for it. Comments. Please, so, please. Uh, the first thing that you said about the less common topic, right? so yes. that less make me uh, continue in my research, actually, because I, I am very impressed about that. that it is a sad thing that we had that. That phrase. phrase yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm working with heritage language speakers mm -hmm. in the United States. So I <coughs> I see there is lots of language loss. Yes. If they don't keep learning Turkish, absolutely and if they forget true. The culture. So uh, I think we need more researchers and more people to get involved in to change that thing. And, absolutely. Uh, and by the way, so we have among our Title VI language centers, we have one here at UT that's on open resources for language teaching creating. For example, if I create a textbook in Russian, rather than have someone else create a different textbook or sell my textbook, we just make them open and everyone can use it so we don't have to reinvent the wheel constantly. We do a lot of that here, especially for Lictals, who are less commonly taught. The, another language center in Los Angeles is the Language Center for Heritage Languages. And it's not simply, it's run by a consortium of teachers of Russian, so one of their main languages they look at is Russian. The other language they look at, though, is Persian, because there's a large Persian population in Los Angeles. But it's not just for Russian and Persian, it's for any heritage language learning, and they're always looking for partners. So if any of you are interested, particularly the question of heritage students learning of, of Turkish descent, learning their native language, their heritage language, check out this center, it's online. UCLA Heritage Language Center. They can they have a lot of resources. Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't create your own syllabus if they've already got something you can use. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, please. Hi. Thank you so much. Of course. You have recruiting students, and you didn't really address that at all. 
Can you help us? I, so I would say, I, I, I hope I did, uh, by creating these courses, that's how we recruit them. My, my sense is, uh, I, I'm going to use a, a bit of a cliche here, if you build it, they will come. If you build a language course that students, even by, by the definition of what's in your syllabus, as we were talking about, students see is inclusive, is individuated, is uh, relevant, culture rich, they will come to your classes. My whole thing is, if we go out and I take a megaphone and yell, take Turkish, it's a great language, we have Turkish delight, free, everyone gets to eat candy in class. You'll get some students, but that's not who we, that, they will be here for a day or two of class and then they'll leave. I want students who want to invest in, in our languages, who want to take Turkish, stay with it, really invest in it. And to do that, we need to build these courses. But what if you have an administration and you just don't see the need to build courses? You, it's, well, wait, so if you've got an administration who's letting you offer Turkish, I'm saying build the right class that they're letting you build. I'm not asking you to say, go to your administration and say, I want to add new courses. I want to take the curriculum that we have now. They take the, say they, they allow you, I don't know, three years of Turkish, two years of Turkish, one year of Turkish. Make it the best Turkish course there is, because then you're going to have students who say, we need another year. Where there is that demand, the administration will bend. That's how it works. It is, it is a, a, unfortunately, a horrifically capitalist program uh, administratively in all of our universities. Only demand that will bring in money will, will be what our administrators listen to. So if you get students who finish your program and say, what's next? That was terrific. I, I, I want to do more. And you say, well, we, we don't have any more courses because our dean won't let us offer another course. And then you tell that student, you know, go to your dean. Tell the dean we need another Turkish course. I'm dead serious. I'm serious. Don't put it on yourself. Don't put your own careers at risk here. <laughs> Don't go to the dean and say, I need another course because I got, I'm really good. But let your students tell the dean how great your course was and that you need a second year or a third year. That's what matters. That's what will matter. Because they care mostly about will there be enough students to, to take this course. They don't want to give you a course and then have you offer it to two students. They want that group of 10 to come out of your class and say, eight of us want to take second year Turkish. Yeah, that's what's going to do. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I believe that secondary, uh, secondary language education is also important. Here, lots, a lot of people are from college. Yes. Uh, colleges, different colleges, but I'm coming from secondary schools. And uh, secondary schools will feed colleges. For Absolutely, the they will. So, um, I think for Turkish, when I search online, I cannot see in many places secondary uh, Turkish language courses right. other right. than in some charter schools. Right. So I believe, the, if possible, I don't know, I don't have experience, college uh, teaching experience, but if possible, if we could have partnerships with the colleges, so we have every year, uh, only in our charter system, we have more than 3,000 students this year. For example, this, this year is the least, one of the least years for the um, enrollment. It's almost about 3,900 something. So this means a huge number. So we don't, we don't, um, uh, I cannot say that we're giving a good, very good language teaching, Turkish teaching, and we cannot make them ready for the college, but um, if colleges can uh, support us, uh, if we, can have partnerships, different partnerships. Yes. I think we can um, improve our uh, courses. So you, you hit it in one. It's all about articulation. It's getting, yeah. it's matching up a good program at a university or college with a school willing to try to do it. So first thing to do is look at, look for colleges, universities that have centers such as ours here, that have a Center for Middle Eastern Studies. If they have such a center, part of their mission, I assure you, is outreach. They are looking for schools to partner with. And usually, not always, but usually they have at least some limited funds to help support these programs. What we've been able to do is, with very limited funds, is at least do, um, uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, a flex program, foreign language exploratory programs. These are short three week, we usually do them in a sequence of two six week courses for our students, four languages in six weeks. 
they get just an introduction to a little bit of Turkish, a little bit of Persian, a little bit of Arabic. They get a sample of the languages so that when they go to college, they can say, you know, we had a little bit of that Turkish. I think I'll take a course in Turkish. Those kind of programs really do develop a base among our students that's terrifically useful. So thank you. That, that point, by the way, I, I, it's, it's more than recruitment. That's building the base on which we can make our university programs succeed. I, I missed your speech at the beginning of your speech. Do you have a flash program in this college? Absolutely. I'll, I'll, leave these with, I'll leave these with you, Jeanette, and you can post them. I don't know if you have a website here with... Uh, just email them to whoever, whichever participants want them. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, we'll be uh, collecting slides today. Mm -hmm. We're also videotaping. Um, our videotaping is going to be a little bit homemade, but uh, I'll talk about all these logistics, but there'll be materials available for everybody after is the conference as well. Is it only uh, UT students? Or we don't have AP programs for Turkish. Right. In right. Spanish, they have. So um, we don't have, but if you could have some... Um, little um, registrations mm -hmm. for open to high schools for, I don't know how many students every year you're taking, but mm -hmm. we could try to find um, some students uh, can join to your flagship program. That's right, so that would yes. be something that would require yeah. dual, de <coughs> sorry, dual degree, which the university does do, but it would require us to just know what these who are these schools, right? What students we would be getting Our so that Turkish we can make an agreement? Our Turkish flagship program is represented here. There's only one in the U.S. Okay. You can raise your hand. This is Zeynep. Yes. Um, and she works with the Turkish flagship Zeynep, program welcome. at the University of Indiana at and, Bloomington. And we just had the Russian flagship program. That's so right. Just you now have yes. five. You have five. You have more than any. Two, yes. You have too many. <laughs> you have five <laughs> flagships. Many, yes. It's terrific. It's just terrific. We're so, we're so bad. Okay, get one more question. I have to go teach fourth year Russian. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, but I have to support this uh, institutional collaboration with high school yes. because my university has a um, language institute. Mm -hmm. We don't have a flagship, but they collaborate with high schools yes. and every year, actually, every semester, they bring high schools. To, so there are two, uh, one is World Language Day and the other is Kids from College. Precisely. So which is, you know. Those are at least kind of, again, outreach programs yes. that will bring students they, together. They they're also very useful. for, you know, that's someone told languages like Turkish, so they reach out to me or they end up yeah. instructing and, and then um, we, you know, we teach kids kid and also high school, high school students, students to Turkish. That's what you like want. It's their first time, most, most of these kids, I mean, in Wisconsin, imagine, like their first time. Right, these are exploratory uh, courses Turkish. and these get students yes. interested. You're yeah. exactly right. And Thank you is, for that. This is very important. Especially, I mean, it, it's not that just because we have languages, mm -hmm. it's doable in other uh, universities so, as well. So thank you. And I saw one last hand. Okay, one more question. Um, yes, ma'am. Coming back to having inclusive language classes, yes. I was wondering if um, the, the Russian language program here has a policy or system in place to accommodate students who consider themselves gender neutral and do not identify with the international or We do. Uh, we actually do now. Uh, this is uh, university-wide. It's not just through our individual language programs. However, each of our individual languages has to adopt it as we wish. So in Russian, it's interesting. I was very uneasy about what the solution was that our students wanted to take, which was to use, we have a middle pronoun in Russian. So we have a she pronoun, a he pronoun, and an it pronoun. Uh, the students were wanted to be considered, with two students, gender neutral, wanted this O, Ano. So, on, ana, ano. Wanted to be ano. I didn't like that because the pro this pronoun is only used to identify inanimate objects. And I didn't like the idea of a human being being referred to as an it. When I got online, however, and looked at blogs of LGBTQ communities, that's what they're using. They're, that has been agreed upon as the way of, of distinguishing. Now, what some communities have done to make it relevant to an animate a human being is to change the stress from ano to ono. And so there's an ano that means it, and an ano that means they non-plural. And I just say the best thing we can do as instructors, by the way, well, I'm a, a, the majority of you, as I'm understanding from your comments and all, are either heritage, some of you are heritage speakers or native speakers, is to look at your uh, native speaking approaches on, in the web space. What is the, and again, I understand this, I know this from the Arabic speaking community, it's not always easy to find an LGBTQ community in, say, the Muslim world, 
but they're there. They are there. So for the case of Arabic, we went to Beirut, where there is a relatively large LGBTQ community, and saw in their blog space how they were negotiating this gender-neutral territory that wasn't he, she, but they, non-plural. That was a terrific point. Thank you. And unfortunately, guys, I'm going to run into each fourth year, but I plead once again on behalf of the Texas Language Center to welcome you to UT and enjoy the beautiful weather, but indoors. <laughs> my, oh, I, oh, I did put it here. So, Jeanette, I will absolutely get, make sure if you could please share my email address with them as okay. well. It's just simply my I'll initials, T.J. Garza. So it's my last name, Garza. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Austin U, uh, Austin U, Texas, in one year. So, but I'll make sure that on the list that you get it as well. I would love to be in contact with any and all of you. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.